Have you ever dreamed of the deep sea? Do you wonder what lies in the ridiculous and almost infinite depths of the ocean? Me too. In this video, we're going to be exploring that. No, I, I don't have a submarine. Um, I just couldn't hire one in time for this video. But I do have this extremely long bit of cardboard. I have access to the internet and quite a fair amount of marine books. So stay tuned for an exploration of the deep sea like no other. B because if you try to get to the deep sea with a bit of cardboard and the internet, um, So what am I doing with this giant bit of cardboard that I am promising you a deep sea exploration with? Well, I'm going to paint it as a scientific art kind of experiment. Imagine that this whole bit of cardboard, which happens to be 184 centimetres in length, is the entire depth of the ocean. I'm going to paint where the light reaches, where it ends, and then all the species you can find as we work our way down. I've pulled out some species that I find super interesting, ones that I think are really cool and that we should talk about. But the main point of this is to kind of emphasize how much we don't know. I mean, how amazing and crazy this massive bit of the planet that we can't get to very much and only a select lucky handful of people have got to explore and what we have found just from the tiny bit that we have explored already. Let's get painting! <laughs> zone goes down to 200 meters which the scale in this ocean uh, this 200 meters is only three centimeters of the 184 that we've got a really minimal part of our ocean that houses all of the pretty much life in the ocean that we know and we don't know all of it even in that zone so it's quite an impressive part it's also a really, really productive part, which is kind of obvious when you know that most of the productivity is fueled by photosynthesis, so using light to produce energy, basically. So it's things like plankton and seaweeds and the base level of every food system relies basically on organisms pretty much that can photosynthesize. So it's not surprising that the most productive part of our oceans will be in the top 200 metres because by the time you get to the bottom of the 200 metres you only have 1% of the light that you had at the top. So we're only 3 centimetres in and we're already lost 99% of the light at the surface. So how deep does the other 1% go. Well, it goes for 1,000 metres. So, you only have light in the entire ocean down to down to 1,000 metres. So now, this entire section is the only section that light will reach at all. 200 metres of that pretty much reaches photosynthesis can occur. The rest from 200 to 1,000 metres no so no photosynthesis can occur and light just can get down there but i mean it's not like you're going to go down there and be like oh i can see everything it's not going to happen now the rest of this entire bit of cardboard i.e the rest of our ocean zero light reaches it none we have got no inkling from the sun no natural light makes its way to the rest of it which is kind of mind-blowing and kind of crazy to think that so much of our ocean is an absolute pitch black. So before I tell you uh, the other two zones, the, this, the rest of this deep sea is split up into another, split in half into two zones. I mean it's all black, I'm just gonna paint it all black now because there is no light left. 
project zone which is at 0 to 200 meters. Now by the time we get to the bottom of this we've lost most of our light and we hit the meso project zone. This zone goes down to a thousand meters and at the end of this we completely lose light. So as you can see there is an absolutely insane amount of ocean that doesn't have any light whatsoever. There's a lot of black paint here and a lot of darkness. So what zones do we have once we've lost all of the light? Well, we have the Baffy Project Zone, which is from 1,000 to about 4,000 metres. Instead of being split by light, it's now split by where the continental slope reaches. So on the continental plate, we have uh, different zones. So the slope so the sloping part is um, what we now call the bathypelagic zone um, and goes down to about 4,000 metres. It will then, as this plane is flattened out into abyssal planes, this section gets split up into the rest of the abyssal zone. And finally, the hadal zone, which is the last aspect of it, is where we have ocean trenches. So anything in the Hadal zone is anything that's kind of receding down into the continental um, plate itself because they're splitting apart and forming ocean trenches. The Bathy Plagic zone goes to here, the Abyssal zone goes to here, and so from here onwards we are in the, what's called the Hadal zone, which is bonkers. At 6,000 metres, this is the cutoff point, and then we go down to 10,994, which is the deepest known part of our ocean. There is a, I mean, that is a massive, massive zone in comparison to what else is out there. So why do we have these deep bits? Well, it's the points at which these continental plates separate and there becomes things like trenches. And the deepest known part is the Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench, which is kind of, trench system that runs from pretty much where the Japan, Philippines, down to Australia, that kind of section, that's the deepest part, or known part, of our oceans. So it'd be a bit ridiculous for me to carry on talking about this in such a stretched out way. So we're going to zoom in, we're going to take a closer look at each of the zones and what awesome species survive in there and their adaptation to do so, and we're eventually going to work our way down to the crazy creatures that can actually survive at 10,994 metres underwater. Wow. So you may just think that I would skip the epipelagic zone, this is a video about the deep sea, and really it's not that deep relative to the rest of it. There are still, however, two species that I'm just going to call out and say about uh, in the epipelagic zone, because it's still down to 200 metres, and I mean, if 1% of the light only reaches the bottom, then, you know, for some species, particularly those that photosynthesize, they're going to struggle. And so there are a couple of species, at least, that are termed deep sea, even in the epipelagic zone, despite not yet having reached the deep sea. One is seagrasses. Seagrasses are the only real marine plant, um, and they definitely need light to photosynthesize. Um, so the deepest one of them sits at 58 metres, which is quite impressive um, considering I don't think much light will get down there. Um, so that is a deep sea seagrass. We also have deep sea corals because they have uh, photosynthetic um, symbiotic algae with them and they need to photosynthesise. So uh, they're then often not a deep sea being. Um, they can grow down to 100 metres and they're actually found off the North Sea, I think it's pretty, pretty cool. So the next section is the mesopelagic zone, but before we get too far away from the surface, I know we've only gone 200 metres so far, um, I want to talk about some visitors. Now what do you mean by visitors? Well, 
things that I would class as visitors are things that need to breathe air um, and therefore are visitors to the ocean in general. So who are these visitors to the deep sea? Well, we're going to pick two examples. We're going to have a mammal and we're going to have a bird. And as we know, penguins can't fly, bless them, but they are absolutely insane hydrodynamic little bullets of energy that can do absolutely amazing things underwater. They're agile, they're cool, um, even if they're the clumsiest things on earth on land. So penguins dive for food and catch lots of fish and yummy things in the sea, but how deep do they dive? You would think that they would just go in for a swim, try and catch whatever's on the surface, but no, penguins, they want to do more and they are built to do more. This diving penguin is the emperor penguin, of course, because they rock and are emperor of all of the penguins, and they can dive to 565 meters. Just pausing to let you take that in, 565 meters. That's incredible. So the next uh, species I want to talk about is marine mammal. These are things like dolphins and whales, things like they are dolphins and whales and such. Um, they obviously also need to breathe air, so they can't live in the deep sea permanently because they have to hold their breath. Now there is one marine mammal that takes it to the next level and in fact skips the mesoplastic zone and goes straight into the bathypelagic zone. It feeds on different types of squid which like to occupy the deeper areas of the sea and it's the Cuvier beaked whale which is the deepest diving mammal that we know of. They can dive to 2,992 metres. Again, pausing to let that go through your head. I mean, come on, that's insane. They can hold their breath for over two and a half hours, which is insane. Can you imagine watching a Lord of the Rings film and not breathing the entire time? I mean, now there's one more type of migration I want to talk about before we move on. And this is thought to be the biggest migration or daily migration on the planet. Um, or if not, at least one of. Um, it's grouped kind of into one giant migration thing called dial vertical migration, which basically means a vertical migration up in depth twice daily. It's normally, uh, there's a whole bunch of species that do it, but it's really kind of set off by zooplankton. So zooplankton are tiny, tiny organisms that eat plankton. So plankton are often photosynthetic and require light to um, get energy to produce photosynthesis and stuff. So they always live up in the top 200 meters, pretty close to the surface so that they can get a ton of sunlight and, you know, be nice and full up. Zooplankton, um, however, during the day when it's light, you are much more likely to be seen and therefore eaten. So during dial, the point of dial vertical migration for zooplankton is that they move upwards when it's near sunset for night time so that they can feed on all of the plankton that have been photosynthesizing all day. And then when the sunlight comes back up and they don't want to be seen by things that eat them, they move back down. And they move hundreds and hundreds of meters. They go from the surface right into the mesopelagic zone and um, really can, can travel massive distances daily. And with that comes a whole host of other species that also kind of participate in this because that is a massive part of the food chain that is moving up and down. So different species of um, like whales and things will dive and feed at certain depths and kind of follow the zooplankton um, along with it as well as a whole host a whole host of tons of other species um, that participate in this massive kind of migration up and down each day, which is really cool. Okay, so mesopelagic siren, 200 to 1000 meters. We are gonna whip through some species here. Um, not saying it's particularly 
boring section because it's not and there are some fab species in it but this is the kind of deep sea bit that there is still plenty of life living and thriving in here so it's very difficult to pick out a few species of particular uh, amazement because actually this zone is still pretty productive um, a productive part of the ocean and then as we go down it gets more difficult and therefore we find some weirder species um, at 300 meters you can find the world's largest arthropod so that is the giant spider crab they like to hang around 300 meters and uh, eat a load of dead dying things and hunt out some stuff um, and they're really cool I mean they're massive they can be up to 18 foot claw to claw I'm five foot that's so many of me <laughs> they're huge wow I really want to see one of those species now I really want to see <laughs> an 18 meter claw to claw length crab can you imagine the hugs maybe you would want to hug them Okay, moving down to 500 meters, we have um, still got anemones, still got anemones going around to 500 meters, they're still there, and it's quite hardy, they're quite good, um, so you know, anemones, still got them at 500 meters, and we also have uh, the Atlantic wolf fish, which is quite a cool looking weird fish, um, they really like to hang out at, at 500 meters and are quite common at 500 meters, they're like a, you know, that's their zone, they're good there, they're the, they're, it's not weird for them to be there, they are just like plain old, oh there's one of those Atlantic warfishes again, right. what's that I hear you shouting? How deep do barnacles live? I'm only watching this so that I can find out how deep barnacles go. Well I've got the facts for you here, thank you for shouting that out, I knew that's what you were all waiting for. They, they can be found down to 600 meters. That's blooming impressive. That's impressive, right? Six whole hundred meters. That's twice the depth of the Eiffel Tower. So I know I've answered your favorite thing, but please continue watching for the rest of it. There are still exciting facts to be learned. And then at 914 meters, which I think is crazy, is kind of the depth that you find anglerfish at. Um, but I mean, look at 914 meters in comparison to you know 10,000 meters. I would have thought that anglerfish were like deep, deep, deep sea fish, but actually, just at 914, just that. Moved into the Bathy Pelagic Zone, we are under a thousand meters, and there are there is no natural light whatsoever. So at this point onwards, we are definitely. 100% in what is classed as the deep sea. Now the deep sea itself actually um, compromises of 95% of the total livable space on planet Earth. 95% of the space that things could theoretically live in is in the deep sea, which I think is absolutely crazy if you think about how much land we have that we know that that we can live in and how much of the seas have a first you know thousand meters of water and you've still got 95 percent of the livable space on earth in the deep sea but we have only yet to explore uh five percent of this the people that are super lucky and have managed to get down to uh the deep sea which i'm very very jealous of uh, it's incredibly few. I mean, it's so much pressure and it's so deep and it's so difficult and dangerous to get down to. But I mean, it's not done. I think I read somewhere that you are statistically more likely to go to space than you are to get a glimpse of the deep sea, which kind of shows you just how little we have been able to get down and explore. Uh, again, I start off. Um, we're jumping way down. We're jumping straight down to 2140. We are going to start with a isopod. Now, if you are uh, in, in your garden as a kid or in your garden as an adult, uh, not just kids that see them, you would have found a woodlouse at some point. Uh, down in Kent, they are called pea bugs. I know there's a cool map that says that they're called lots of different things uh, in different places, so look that map up if you want to laugh. 
these pea bugs and wood louse, I don't know, maybe the size of my nail fit right in the palm of your hand. That's not the case with these. So wood louse are isopods and they also have basically marine relations, cousins, in the sea. In fact, there's a lot more marine isopods than there are terrestrial isopods. Um, but in the deep sea, there is also a phenomena called gigantism, which basically means the deeper you go, the bigger things get, which is minorly terrifying to see in pictures. So if you want a good old scare and a good old fright, go Google uh, giant isopods because they are crazy. If you don't like creepy crawly things as a kid, then you are not going to like these pictures, but I highly recommend you go look at them because they are so cool. Uh, so a giant isopod can actually reach 76 centimetres in length. Uh, again, I'm pausing to let that settle in. 76 centimetres. They can get pretty big and they're pretty cool. But they live down to 2,140 2, metres. An exciting species now. And again, um, this just kind of this story just shows how little we know. Friends just ever caught one sighting of this species and it's the colossal squid. This is where stories of the kraken and um, you know pirate ships being destroyed at sea with giant tentacles, the awesome stories which I think are cool. Um, this these come from the giants squid, colossal squid, giant, enormous kind of family thing, um, which are found quite often, not quite often, but are found washed up, which is where we've probably seen them most. But we have caught the colossal squid once, and he was, squid was seen at 2,200 metres. Um, so we know that they live down to depths like that, but if you've only seen it once, I mean, they could range in depth a lot more and a lot less than that. So I'm gonna put them in there. These uh, have the largest eye known at any animal kingdom, which is 30 centimeters, which is a pretty decent size eye. So the cloth squid um, is the biggest of any squid in the families, and squid families, and can reach up to 13 meters in length. So pretty big. So now we've jumped down to 3000 meters. And this is something very strange and I've put it in because I laughed and pretty much cried when I saw the video of kind of its, dis I think it was its discovery or it was just caught on film again. It's called a pelican eel. It's literally if you combined a pelican with an eel. I ain't question how that happened. Obviously it didn't happen that way. But you get what I mean. Pelican eel, uh, give it a Google. I'm, I'm highlighting the species only for, if I can find the link, I'll put it below, how hilarious the narration of its discovery was. So when they send ROVs down and things, um, so remote operated vehicles, video cameras to the deep sea, you also have a team of marine bar just watching and analyzing the video as it happens so that you can you know, point the ROV at a cool bit. And they just saw this thing and it was, no idea what it was, we're like, oh, what's that? And I'm pretty sure the pelican, I don't know if it was yawning or something, but my God, it went from like, what's that to, oh, what, what, what is that? I mean, it was really funny and great narration from the marine crew and team there. Um, it's worth a watch, definitely worth a watch. Still going down to so in the depths, we get to orb jellies. I've put this one in because it is a spectacularly beautiful creature. Um, lots of bioluminescence and lights and just a really awesome deep sea jellyfish that you should totally, totally check out because it's pretty and who doesn't love something like that. 960 metres just before the split to the abyssopelagic zone we have the rather infamous Dumbo octopus which I'm including because I totally think it's awesome. I mean, it's so cute and kind of crazy that this octopus lives so deep down in the sea. I mean, 3,960 meters is incredible. Um, 
just to think that you know deep sea squid and octopus and and the cephalopod world have conquered such a deep sea environment is bonkers uh, to me as well as doing so well at surface. Can I just remind you guys that now is the point that we're reaching the Cougar Beaked Whale's diving depth. I mean that's incredible. We have come so far in our deep sea exploration to the point at which you know this thing dives, not lives, but dives. I mean I've got to take my hat off if I'm going to have one on uh, to that animal because that is so impressive. So now we hit the abyssal plain. We are at uh, 4,000 meters down. So the abyssal plain, again, um, there isn't much as in like the plains itself. There isn't too much, I don't know, action going on. That's not too many species that are there. But what you do still find down at this depth are hydrothermal vents. Now hydrothermal vents are an insane, unique, ecosystem that supports a massive variety of life. At 5,000 meters is actually the deepest known hydrothermal vent is off the coast of the Caribbean. Now hydrothermal vents are a hub, an oasis in the desert. They are um, really kind of quite high biomass, not massively biodiverse because they're a very specific amount of species that can cope with the conditions. So hydrothermal vents occur when there are there is tectonic activity below the surface so at places where there's ridges plates pulling apart or hot spots just super hot bits in, in the earth's crust and water gets super heated to like 400 degrees c it it because hot air rises it then shoots through the cracks in the floor bringing with it the super hot water but also things um, like metals and some of the um, sulfides and things that are in the rocks below. And it looks like they're smoking because as soon as the hot, air, uh, the hot water reaches the really, you know, two to three degree cold air, the metals precipitate out and it kind of forms like a smoke. And they look really cool. Um, now I said before that the majority of life on the, the ocean floor, the ocean, in the ocean, and in life in general relies on photosynthesis but obviously at 5,000 meters down there is no way there is any light whatsoever um, so it's kind of crazy that there's these big ecosystems that survive down there and it's because of bacteria these bacteria have kind of kind of they have developed a way to sustain themselves without photosynthesis and that then becomes the base of the food chain become symbiotic with things like giant tube worms and there's also and, and that produces then they can survive and then this whole food chain is kind of built up around around that so you can find crabs and mussels and giant tube worms and all these crazy kind of things um, near these hydrothermal vents. So I'm plopping that in at 5,000 meters because that's the deepest uh, hydrothermal vent that we know about. Um, then the next, I suppose, big milestone is kind of 6,000 metres. This is right before the, or right at where the Hadal zone starts. And the reason I'm putting this in is because this is kind of the, the sea floor. Most abyssal plains kind of on average are at 6,000 metres depth. Uh, again, I said there's not much there, but lots of scientists study um, abyssal plains because you can drop food down and see what happens. Um, I watched a couple of videos and some of the, the guys that did that and they found things like uh, lots of snails, um, these things called cusk eels, made like a feeding frenzy. Um, so there's lots of things that can be down there, but um, isn't, uh, it's not like this long, massive list. Um, it's not so the, ne the next big milestone, really we're jumping right the way down, way into the Hadal zone, we're going to 8,178 meters. Why so specific? Well, all of them have been specific, but this is the point at which the world's deepest surviving living fish has been found. Which is pretty amazing, considering that a fish is quite a complex organism um, with bone structures and everything, and it's very it, difficult to live in the deep sea. 
before I explain how awesome it is that this fish is found so deep, uh, let me just kind of talk a bit about some things like pressure. Under pressure. Dun, 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 dun. Sorry. Sorry. It's not just the fact that there's no light and it's not just the fact that it's a cold temperature that is a big problem with living in the deep sea. I think and probably I'm gonna go with the biggest problem, bar maybe light, but I'm going with this might be more of an issue, is pressure. So going down in depth creates an absolutely enormous amount of pressure, which messes with everything in the system. And by system, I mean a body. When you get down to the bottom of the sea, it has 9,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. So every square inch of your body would have an extra 9,000 pounds pushing down on it. So, you know, definitely not easy. And I mean, it's not easy to survive somewhere where there's not a lot of other things for you to eat. So it's crazy that um, a fish is found on there and it's called the Mariana snailfish. So good on you fish. You, you, you've gone to a lot of effort to, to make the species survive. You're definitely not going to get uh, hounded that much down there. Um, but I've got that. Um, but I've got that. I mean, that's so deep. Okay, we've reached the end. We've reached the bottom. We have reached Challenger Deep. I know, it's been a long journey. We've worked hard. Our submarine has made it there. 10,994 meters, all right at the bottom. Um, and a few people have made it down. Uh, most recently, James Cameron went down in the submarine. I haven't actually watched the documentary or the film where he did it, which I really want to see. But they got to the bottom and they found cool things. Uh, the main thing they kind of found was amphipods. Now amphipods are kind of like isopods, but they're squashed the other way. So if you imagine a round circle, an isopod is squashed like this. So, so that its body is kind of gone bleh. An amphipod, if you imagine a circle is like this So its face is kind of gone It's basically what an amphipod is And um, they are, there's things like sea lice that bite you if you're in the sea You can thank them They're also an absolute pain to ID And um, I'm not a fan of them in general Because I know how difficult they are to, to ID and things Anyway um, my personal genuine nightmare might actually to be to see one of these giant ones um, because at the bottom they are giant like isopods and uh, can be up to a foot in long uh, I, I just look good I don't want to see that I mean they're, they're bad enough as it is when they're tiny can you imagine getting bitten by a giant one I don't think they would bite you because you'd also die if you went outside down in the deep sea but the thought of it is enough um, so these amphipods live down there, I've seen them and I've seen them in like tons, absolute tons of them, so that's impressive that they can live at the deepest place, um, that's good, they can stay away from me. They also found sea cucumbers, which are um, not to be used in a salad, they are things, that, they're squishy things, squishy things under the that look like cucumbers. Um, they're quite cool, they're quite awesome little creatures. I'm not really sure how hard to describe them, uh, except for the fact that they look like a cucumber under the sea. Um, and there's a thing called xenophyophores, and I don't know what they are. which I think is absolutely balmy. I mean, trust things in the sea to do their own stuff and work it out and, and live in all aspects. I mean, 
the adaptations that species show to be able to live and survive in the sea, and especially in such a harsh environment, is, is crazy. So it's not that much of a surprise, I suppose, that there is life at the bottom of the deep sea. But you still have to be in so much awe that these species are down there. I mean, come on! 10,994 meters. much taller than me obviously the entire sea uh, on a bit of cardboard I hope you guys have enjoyed this video I've really enjoyed researching this and kind of trying to make it into an educational type of video and uh, I've really enjoyed painting this and uh, having now having this weird uh, giant sea behind me I really uh, hope you've learned something I hope you find it interesting and I hope it's kind of helped put how deep and how awesome our oceans are into a bit more perspective for you and hopefully you'll go have a google and learn some more for yourself so thanks for watching everyone if you like this video make sure to share subscribe um especially if you like the educational side let me know in the comments i want to hear from you and i want to see what you guys think um i'm always trying to make my videos better so leave some feedback thanks for watching everyone have a great week and i'll see you next wednesday bye Mm-hmm.